this video, we are going to talk about Hess's Law and the Heats of Formation. Here, you will see the learning competencies and the specific learning outcomes. Okay, so let's recall what thermochemistry is. Thermochemistry is a very important field of study because it helps to determine if a particular reaction will occur and if it will release or absorb energy as it occurs. Or will there be an explosion? Okay, so to do that, we need to be familiar with the thermochemical equation. Thermochemical equation is a balanced chemical equation in which the exact value of enthalpy change, physical states, and the number of moles of reactants and products are specified. For example, this is the thermochemical equation for the combustion of methane. You have here the enthalpy change, the physical states, as you can see, all of the reactants and the products are gases. And the number of moles of each reactant and product. So the coefficients. Okay. Now, there are two ways on how to calculate the value of enthalpy. First is by utilizing the Hess's law, which I will explain later. And second is by using the standard heat of formation. Now, Hess's law states that when reactants are converted to products, the change in enthalpy is the same whether the reaction takes place in one step or in a series of steps. So I remember this Chinese proverb that can be an analogy to this. It says, there are many paths to the top of the mountain, but the view is always the same. Oh, wow. <laughs> Okay. In other words, the path is not important. What is important is the start and the finish. This is the same in enthalpy. Regardless of the number of steps to get to product D, the enthalpy is still the same as the direct or one-step conversion of reactant A to reactant D. This is true due to the fact that enthalpy is a state function. State function meaning enthalpy depends only on the initial and the final state. That is only the nature of reactants and products, not the quantity or the number of steps. The enthalpy change would be the same whether the overall reaction takes place in one step or many steps. Now, in calculating Hess's law, there are certain rules that you should follow. First, if a reaction has a specific delta H, the reverse of the reaction will have the same delta H, but negative. So from X plus Y yielding Z, it's positive one, two, three kilojoules per mole. When you reverse it to Z yielding X plus Y, it's the same, but it's negative one, two, three. Second, if you multiply the molar quantity by a number, let's say I multiplied this by 2, you also have to multiply the delta H by the same number. Okay. If you notice, negative 1, 2, 3 was doubled. Again, remember, you have to multiply the whole equation. These are the rules that you can use to be able to add the equations together. Now let's have some examples. Let's say we are interested in the standard enthalpy formation of carbon monoxide. So we might represent the reaction as this. So graphite plus one half O2 yielding CO. Now, if you can balance this without the fraction, it's okay. As long as it's balanced, it's fine. Okay. However, the burning graphite also produces some CO2. Right? So we cannot measure the enthalpy change for carbon monoxide directly as shown. Instead, we must employ the method based on Hess's law. Okay, So it is impossible to carry out the following two separate reactions which go to completion. First, there is the combustion of graphite that yields CO2. The second is the combustion of carbon monoxide, letter B, that yields CO2. Bye. Remember the rule in Hess's law. You can reverse an equation, but do not forget 
to reverse the sine as well. With that, we can reverse equation B. So why equation B, not equation A? Because as you can see in the main equation, graphite is the reactant. So equation A stays as is because it has graphite on the reactant side. Then you can see carbon monoxide on the product side of the main equation. However, looking at equation B, it's on the reactant side. So you have to reverse it. This will give us equation C. If you notice, delta H is now positive. Okay. Now we can add these two equations. So CO2 will cancel out because it is present on both sides. Then one mole of oxygen minus one half mole of oxygen will give us one half oxygen. So the standard heat of formation is negative 110.5 kilojoule per mole. <laughs> I need a pause so I can laugh. Oh my God, what was that? Okay, remember, the general rule in applying Hess's law is to arrange a series of chemical equations in such a way that when added together, all species will cancel except for the reactants and products that appear in the main or overall reaction. This means that we want the elements on the left and the compound of interest on the right of the arrow. Further, we often need to multiply some or all of the equations representing the individual steps by the appropriate coefficients. Now, another way to solve delta H is to use the standard enthalpies of formation. This method of measuring delta H works for compounds that can be readily synthesized from their elements. Again, it only works for compounds that can be easily synthesized from their elements. Standard enthalpy of formation is the agreed arbitrary reference point for enthalpy symbolized by this. Substances are said to be in the standard state at one atmosphere, hence the term standard enthalpy. The superscript, like the degree sign, represents the standard state conditions, one atmosphere, and the subscript F stands for formation. So by convention, the standard enthalpy of formation of any element in its most stable form is zero. Remember this, if the element is in its most stable form, for example, a pure um, aluminum solid, the standard enthalpy of formation is zero. So let's have another example. Let's say oxygen. Molecular oxygen, O2, is more stable than the other allotropic form of oxygen, which is ozone, O3, at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius. Thus, we can write the standard enthalpy of oxygen as zero, but the standard enthalpy of ozone is equal to 142.2 kilojoules per mole. Okay, again, why? Because O2 is more stable than O3. Based on this reference for elements, we can now define the standard enthalpy of formation of a compound as the heat change that results when one mole of the compound is formed from its elements at the pressure of one atmosphere. So the importance of the standard enthalpies of formation is that once we know their values, we can readily calculate the standard enthalpy of reaction. For example, consider this hypothetical reaction where small letters A, B, C, and D are stoichiometric coefficients. For this reaction, the standard enthalpy of reaction is given by this equation. So the coefficient times the standard enthalpy of formation minus the coefficient times the standard enthalpy formation of the reactants. To put it simply, we can use this equation. Standard enthalpy of reaction is equal to the summation 
of the standard enthalpy of formation of the products minus the summation of the standard enthalpy of the reactants. Okay, so just remember, it's products minus reactants. M and N here denote the stoichiometric coefficients for the reactants and products. The sigma, again, means the sum of. To use this equation, or to calculate the standard enthalpy of the reaction, we must know the delta HF values of the compounds that take part in the reaction, okay? This is usually in your textbooks or <laughs> your teacher should give this, okay? Okay, I'm done, thank you. Okay, again, just to reiterate this method of measuring the enthalpy of formation works for compounds that can be readily synthesized from their elements. So let's have an example. So this is the thermite reaction involving aluminum and iron 3 oxide. Given the equation, calculate the heat released in kilojoules per grams of aluminum reacting with ferric oxide. The delta HF for iron liquid is 12.40 kilojoules per mole. Now, if you notice, this reaction is highly exothermic. Okay, so using the general um, formula or equation in solving the standard enthalpy of the reaction, we can get this one, right? Okay, so products, I have Al2O3. The coefficient is one, so I have one here. Plus the second product, 2Fe. So if you notice, two here, so the coefficient, two is in front, multiply to the standard enthalpy of formation of Fe minus the reactants, okay? So 2Al plus one times the standard enthalpy formation of Fe2O3. So sir, where can we get the values of the standard enthalpy of formation? Tama. So you may actually refer to your book or the internet, if you can, for the standard enthalpy formation of each products and reactants. So this is the table. What you have to do is to get the values of each compound. So for Al2O3, it's negative 1,669.8 kilojoules per mole. For Fe, it's given in the problem, it's 12.40 kilojoules per mole. Minus the reactants, Al will have zero, because again, that's the stable form of aluminum plus Fe2O3. Fe2O3 is this one, negative 822.2. After that, after you have obtained the standard enthalpy of formation, just substitute the values to your equation. So I will have this negative 169.8 plus two times 12.40 minus two times zero, plus negative 822.2. Now do the math, you will get negative 822.8 kilojoules. Now remember aluminum here is two. So this value is the amount of heat released for two moles of aluminum reacted, but we need one mole only and in grams. So what we have to do is to get the ratio okay so divide this eight uh, so divide negative eight to two point eight kilojoules per mole by two then we convert to kilojoules per gram remember the molar mass of aluminum is 26.98 grams so i'll multiply this by one mole aluminum over 26.98 grams final answer would be negative 15.25 kilojoules per gram. I think we moved on from that a little too quickly, if I'm being honest.